As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived also among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavens, the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do great works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The word of God for us, the people of God. <coughs> Let us pray. Father Almighty, thank you for this. So that we might be changed by your grace, heard through your word. All these things in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I remember growing up as the world approached the year 2000. Does anybody remember the panic that ensued around Y2K? It seemed as if the world had lost its collective mind over this boogeyman called the Y2K bug and the countless doomsday scenarios it was supposed to create. Electrical grids would collapse. Banking software would collapse. We'd all be poor overnight. Communication networks would fail. But alas, it all turned out for naught, pun intended. But in evangelical circles, especially in the hyper-evangelical Pentecostal church that I belonged to at the time, the year 2000, the end of one millennia and the beginning of another, was cause for much angst. I remember the pastor of this church getting up and teaching a, I, th I think a 28 week Bible study on Wednesday nights over what the year 2000 would bring. He taught that every 2000 years something momentous happened in our faith, in our world. For example, using a literal reading of the Bible 6,000 years ago, creation dawned. 4,000 years ago, the world was almost wiped out in the great flood. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was crucified and now something significant was on the horizon. Brothers and sisters, repent for the end is nigh as the good street corner preacher teaches. He taught that Jesus was coming back, the rapture was about to happen, the great tribulation was about to begin sometime in the year 2000. And all I could pray was not before graduation, let me graduate. <laughs> he said, so read the left behind books to get an idea of what is about to happen. Repent or be left behind. I'll confess, it scared the snot out of me. I was about to graduate high school and I didn't want the world to end without ha my having a chance to experience the wonders of this world. But when our world is conditioned to think about milestone anniversaries or significant dates, it made sense in its own warped way. Year 2000, things were going to change. So perhaps it's natural as we approach this 500th anniversary of the Great Reformation that we ask this question, is it time 
for another reformation. With our current cultural tendency to try to tear down institutions, our discomfort with the status quo, our efforts to always reform institutions, whether it's police forces or tax codes or college universities, this question does seem to make even more sense to ask now. But in this instance, despite my ingrained problems with authority, my, the psycholog psychologist said, I must confess that I find myself rather uncomfortable with this question. Is it time for another reformation? Reformation, the action or the process of reforming an institution or a practice. It's not tearing down the old and trying to erect something new in its place. Reformation is the process of preserving what is good and changing that which needs to be changed, that which needs to be reformed. Reformation is not something to be taken lightly or approached glibly. It's a long process of hard and serious soul searching. But this is what Martin Luther was hoping to accomplish 500 years ago when he went and nailed his theses to the church door of a cathedral in Germany. This is what Jesus Christ was hoping to do for the faith of God's people so many years ago. This is what even a humble Anglican priest named John Wesley was hoping to accomplish for the Anglican church. They wanted to change an institution that they dearly loved that was made up of people that they loved even more. Jesus Christ didn't want to start a new faith, but he wanted to renew and to reform the faith of Israel. Martin Luther didn't want to break away from the Catholic Church. He wanted to reform the Roman Catholic Church, to reform its practices to better reflect the teachings of Jesus Christ. John Wesley didn't want to start a new church. He did not want to break away from the Anglican church. He was an Anglican priest through and through and died an Anglican priest. He just wanted to reform some of the practices of the Anglican church. They didn't want to start something that would break away from that which was already there. They didn't want to start over from scratch. They saw no need to reinvent the wheel. They just wanted it to remember what it was called to be. They wanted reformation, but schism happened. So this is why this question makes me uneasy. Is it time for another reformation? Because I don't want another schism. Yet despite my unease, despite my reservations, I do have to answer that question. Is it time for another reformation? Yes. Yes, today is the time for another Christian reformation. Today is also the time for another Methodist reformation. But you know what? It will also be time for another reformation tomorrow. It was also time for a reformation yesterday. I pray that we are reformed every day. As individuals, I pray that we are reformed. As a church, as the body of Christ, I pray that we are reformed. We can change all the institutions we want in this world. We can work to try to change every church, every government, every police force, every political party, and every sports league. God knows our Houston Astros bullpen needs some reformation. But until we as human beings are changed, until we, our hearts, are reformed, will the institutions really change at all? Until the people who belong to the various political parties actually care more about the well-being of their fellow human beings than they care more for power or for their own agendas, nothing will really change in our political culture. And if I can pause to touch briefly on one of the hot button issues of the day, until our hearts are changed, nothing will change when it comes to race and racism.
tell those individuals who are racist, but also have positions of authority, whether professors or police officers or administrators or politicians or judges are reformed from the racism that hides in our hearts. It matters little what institutional reforms are enacted because the racism still hides in our hearts. Reforming the institution might change some things, yes, but changing the people who make up an institution changes will transform everything. The same goes for all the other isms and the phobias of this world. Sexism, ageism, and classism. Homophobia, xenophobia, and all the others. An institution only reflects the values of those individual human beings that belong to it and those that make the decisions that affect the entire organization. So we need a reformation of our heart so that we may change an institution. A reformation of the heart. This is the hope that Jesus Christ brought into this world. This is the message of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel message that Paul proclaims in his letter to the Ephesians, that individual lives can be changed for the glory of God. We were all sinners, but we do not need to remain the same because the truth is we are all in need of reformation whether you've been walking this path for decades, whether you have just set out, or whether you have not yet taken that first step, we are all in need of reformation. We are not forever cursed to be trapped in the grasp of sin. The truth is, we all still remain in the need of reformation. There is hope of reformation through Jesus Christ. The story that lives can be changed. Paul writes, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like all the rest, we were deserving of wrath. Of wrath. But I was taught by a professor at Duke to look for the buts in scripture. And I cannot lie, this passage has a big but in the middle of it. Pay attention when you see, he said, a but in scripture. It means that things are about to change. But because of God's love for us, but because of God's love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Only God gets the glory. This but means that we are about to be changed. We are about to be reformed once more. We were once this, but now we're something different. There but for the grace of God go I. There, but for the grace of God, we no longer have to be that, that which we used to be anymore. God has and is renewing us by the grace of God. God is reforming each of our lives by grace through faith into what we were supposed to be, into what God created us to be before sin warped the image of God in our lives. Paul wants us to know this beyond the shadow of a doubt, that we are all in need of reformation by God because we are all marred by sin, but God wants to reform us and God wants to save us because God loves us. And there is nothing that we can possibly do to earn that salvation because salvation is a gift, a gift freely given to God through Jesus Christ and through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. This is the reformation that we need. This is the reformation that it is time for, a daily continual reformation by grace in our lives as God works to restore us. But what is the purpose of this reformation? What are we being reformed for? For we are God's handiwork, Paul writes, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
We are made to do good works. Good works do not save us, but because we are being saved, because we are being renewed, because we are being reformed, we can do good works. And imagine if enough lives are reformed by God. Imagine what it would look like if enough of us said, it's time for another reformation and let it begin in me because God isn't through with me yet. Imagine what could happen. Imagine what Christ's church would look like if enough of us sought to be reformed by God. Imagine how God might work through us for the glory of the kingdom of God. And if Christ's church is reformed, imagine what that might mean for our communities, for Sugarland and for Missouri City. Imagine what they might look like. Imagine how many lives could be touched by God's grace through us if we said, God's not through with me yet. But let's keep going. Imagine what Houston could look like if Sugarland and Missouri or City and Missouri City are changed. Imagine what Texas could look like if Houston is changed. Imagine what our nation could look like if Texas is changed. The world, if our nation is changed. The world could be changed and reformed, renewed, if enough people said, let God be God in my life. If the people said, let God do what only God can do in my life. Imagine how our families might be changed. Imagine how the places where we work might be affected. Imagine how even our own physical lives might be changed when we discover that God has already done everything that we need for salvation, that God has already taken the first step to us and calls us to him. But instead that we want, we don't have to do anything, but instead we want to do something because of what God has already done for us, for all of us and for the good of this entire world. Is it time for another reformation? Speaking personally for my life, it is time. For the sake of the kingdom of God, I hope it's time for another reformation. For the good of the world, I pray for another reformation today, tomorrow, and until the end of time. What about you? Is it time for you? Our prompt this morning for our cards and our bulletins is, I believe the church is called to be. So what do I believe about the church? What do I believe that the church is called to be? I believe that God isn't done. That God isn't done with any of us, with us as individuals or with us as the church yet. I believe that the church is called to be a place where people find grace. I believe that the church is called to be a place of reformation where lives are reformed and renewed every day where the church itself is reformed and renewed through the lives of those people who have been reformed and where the world might be reformed and renewed through the lives that the church touches. I believe that the church is called to be the church for the glory of God. I believe in the doctrine of our United Methodist Church. I believe that Methodism still has much to offer for the kingdom of God but I know that the Methodist Church isn't perfect. I believe that the Methodist Church cannot save a single human being. Only God, by the grace of God, can do that. I believe that God cares more about reforming individual lives than God cares about institutions. But if enough lives are changed, then everything else changes. I believe that God can still use this church, use Christ's church, use the United Methodist Church to change this world. This I believe. This I believe. Is it time for another reformation? Yes, for the glory of God. I pray for a reformation in each and every one of our lives, today, tomorrow, until Christ does come back. Is it time for you? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Amen.